Chicago Hopes for Kids. And this is an article um, that I found incredibly intelligent, um, very easy to understand, and it hits all of the main points that I've been trying to uh, articulate while actually being affected firsthand by these circumstances. Living on the streets or in public spaces means constantly being vulnerable. This includes being susceptible to natural disasters, to illness, and to the system and people we have to place our ideal, uh, and to the system and people we have in place to ideally protect us, law enforcement, and our criminal justice system. Cities are responding to growing frustrations toward homelessness from the public with a new tactic, legislation designed to hide the homeless rather than help them. Being homeless is not explicitly illegal in the United States. But currently, there are civil and criminal laws which make the behaviors of homeless people illegal. Law enforcement threatens or punishes homeless people for doing things in public that every person has to do. This includes activities such as sleeping, sheltering oneself, asking for donations, or simply existing in public spaces. It also includes arbitrarily enforcing other laws and the practice of sweeps, which displaces homeless people from outdoor public spaces through harassment, threats, and evictions from living in camps. These activities make it very difficult for homeless people to exist without committing a crime. A report from the National Homeless Law Center tracked the upwards tend, um, trend of criminalizing homeless in 187 cities and found that it actually has an adverse effect. In these cities, the practices of camping in public increased by 92%, begging increased by 103%, and loitering increased by 35%. These trends happen for many reasons, but partially because certain periods of incarceration under laws criminalizing homelessness directly harm a person's ability to maintain or access public housing. Furthermore, when a homeless person has been arrested for unavoidable behavior, they now have a criminal record and will often miss work for an extended period of time. This creates barriers that lessen the likeliness of employment or losing a pre-existing job. Also, court costs associated with resolving or appealing a case can amount to hundreds or even thousands of dollars. Individuals who do not have the resources to pay are then subject to additional jail time, once again interrupting any chance of maintaining employment. In these ways, an arrest or conviction can lead to lifelong barriers. The consequences of civil penalties are similar, as unpaid tickets can also lead to suspension of one's driver's license or repossession of a vehicle, which drastically limit the prospects of work for that person. The 2019 federal court case, Martin v. The City of Boise, involved six residents of the city who had experienced homelessness and who were arrested or cited due to violating a city ordinance that made it a misdemeanor to use any of the street's sidewalks, parks, or public spaces as a camping place at any time. The plaintiffs claimed this was a violation of their Eighth Amendment constitutional rights, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. The, cruel, the court ruled that cities cannot arrest or punish people for sleeping on public property unless they provide adequate and accessible indoor accommodations. While this ruling acknowledged the fact that it is unfair to criminalize individuals for behaviors that are unavoidable and presumed they had a choice in the matter, there are still too many people in local governments who think that the right answer to homelessness is arresting people. The majority of cities have too few shelter beds. This shortage has been made worse since federal funding was scaled back in 2012. Our system gravitates towards the easiest and quickest solution to homelessness, which is arresting people and getting them or getting them out of sight. However, this is far from an adequate solution. As whether people are in jail or on the streets, they nevertheless remain homeless, increasing crimes. The solution is an attempt to avoid the core issues of homelessness and does not offer people the necessary resources to alleviate the barriers that cause homelessness in the and I posted this in my story today. There's a direct link to this um, article. I found this article, as I said, it pretty much summarizes everything that I have experienced. Um, I have been out here now for four years. I'm a 37 year old woman, mother of four. I've never had uh, a drug addiction. I've never been chemically addicted to something, meaning I woke up and said, oh my God, I need to have this. I have engaged in recreational drug use. I do regret it. Um, you know, but it's and it's not something I currently do. Maybe ten years ago or twenty years ago, it never affected my family life. It never got in the way of me parenting. 
um, and it did not lead to me being homeless in any way. The circumstances surrounding my specific homelessness is that I was violated domestically. I was a victim of dom domestic abuse um, and my significant other was incredibly savvy at working the system. Um, he was the person I appeared on the reality show Love After Lockup with. Everyone doubted me when I said he was beating me up. They said that I was crazy. Um, but then if you Google his name and the person he left me for, he went to jail for beating her up as well. He also went to jail for beating up the woman before me. So now everyone's like, maybe Heather wasn't crazy and they're apologizing to me and the bloggers are rewriting their stories, but it didn't help me any. The bloggers rewriting their stories has not protected me from the slander at my jobs, has not protected me from the in-person stalking, has not protected me from the rape, from the sexual assault in the street in a tent, from having the wall ripped off my tent and being kicked in the face while 18 weeks pregnant with my son Weston. You know, none of that actually helped me. So I'm very grateful for anyone who rewrites their inaccurate blog depictions of me. I appreciate those retractions tremendous, tremendously. Um, you know, however, um, it's not enough. Um, 2020 was the first time that I was ever without a home. My children, I have four now, I had three at the time, lived with me from their birth in 2006 all the way till 2020, four or five days a week from the time they were born, if not more. You know, there were weeks that they were with me six days a week. Um, and this is consistently from the day they were born all the way until I began being abused by this person. Um, when I was abused by him, I called, he was on parole and I called his parole office and I said, he's abusing me. And they said, while he listened on the other, uh, ear pod, you know, the Apple AirPods, he had one of mine. I didn't know. I thought I lost it. He was listening in the apartment upstairs, um, that one of our friends lived in. And I was on the phone with parole saying, I need help. Parole advised me to go to 555 West Harrison and file for an emergency order of protection, which I did, but I couldn't get there in my vehicle because he heard me that I was gonna go there and he disconnected the starter in my vehicle. I then had to use public transportation, which gave him ample amounts of time to race me to the courthouse. And in the state of Illinois, if someone files for an EOP against you, you cannot file for one against them until you've been heard in court in response to the one they have filed against you. I did show up in court. His emergency request was thrown away. Um, it was not granted. Um, but that was too late. I already was thrown into the street. An apartment that and stability that I had for my children my entire life was given to him. And I was thrown outside where I have remained ever since. I've lived in Airbnbs. I slept in the backseat of my vehicle before it was mechanically destroyed, sabotaged and sold, um, supposedly by auction. I paid my vehicle off in full. I don't owe any tickets on the vehicle um, at all. If I have any tickets at all, it has nothing to do with the vehicle. Um, I don't owe any money on the vehicle. So they have no right to um, sell my vehicle at auction. They had no right to mechanically deface my vehicle. They had no right to break into a gated community and you know, key my vehicle, all of which was reported to law enforcement. Domestic violence led me to be homeless in 2020. But what has continued to you know, allow for these circumstances is the fact that I have been repeatedly and regularly calling 311 for assistance, going through the proper city channels and not being assisted in the ways that are supposed to happen, in the ways that we as humans deserve. Um, so now we were finally accepted into housing and we have caseworkers through the Department of Family and Child. We have caseworkers through um, TASC, which is the people who monitor for drug use. And since we're in housing, they're testing us for drug use, which we comply with. And we have passed all of our drug tests, no problem, because we don't drink and we don't drug. Neither myself nor Xavier engage in those sorts of behaviors. Um, Xavier does take CBD or, and marijuana still, which is legal in the state of Illinois, so that's not an issue, but there have never been any other drug issues other than marijuana for either one of us. Um, and I use the term issue incredibly loosely. Now, being in compliance with all of these court ordered you know, services, there is no excuse. If the ball is dropped again, these are blatant human rights violations. We are in you know, contact constantly with everyone. We are complying with all of our services. We come back here on certain days and all hell is breaking loose and they're saying, well, people are being moved to different shelters and you guys are here until the 8th and we'll let you know when it's time to go and where you're gonna go. So we're working with the director of the funding group, Equitable Solutions, and a specific staff member here. So we have our two contact people. I'm gonna text them as soon as I get off of this live, but we have not been given any sort of 
foreshadowing or um, plan, which is incredibly destructive to, to a homeless person. Xavier and I have established ourselves here because we were told we would be here for six months and that from here we would go directly to our own apartment or townhome. We're a family size of six with my four children. So, you know, we are waiting for that. And unfortunately, it looks like that's not going to be what happens. It looks like rather than them keeping their word, we're going to be moved to another shelter before getting into our apartment, possibly. Uh, we still have our fingers crossed. It's not too late. We're, you know, it's not the eighth yet. And there's still time that they could give us our housing. But, you know, we have referrals in for housing and case management in all areas. Um, if there is a way that way should be shared with us, you know, and, and you would think that it is. As, as a person dealing with all of these court-ordered services and being compliant with all of them, plus being a full-time mother, which is my number one job and is never gonna fall to my number two job, no matter what goes on, as long as I have feet um, and can speak I am going and ears to hear, I am going to be checking on my children and doing everything I can to provide for them, send them food, send them groceries, drop off gifts, give them hugs, be on the phone with them, playing Roblox with my youngest, you know, doing whatever I can to be active in their lives, which is my first responsibility as a mother, uh, period. You know, I have a four month old son, breast pumping and breastfeeding is a responsibility of mine. Um, so with all of that being said, can you imagine a person who is told that they would have six months in a shelter and then move to an apartment what it might be like to establish yourself in the community, begin to create relationships with the church, begin to create relationships in the community, begin to seek opportunities, Xavier loves art. Our church just started an art program. Xavier has expressed interest and we've emailed with the director of the art program so that Xavier could get involved. I've expressed interest in volunteering with meal programs. So to move from the position of homelessness into you know, fully functioning member of society, which I've been my entire life, certain considerations need to be made. If they're not made, it's almost like a sabotage, like rather than the resources working to resolve these issues like homelessness. And not only that, but when you're homeless, people are not able to live. Um, in the article that I just shared with you guys, and as I said, if you go to my story here on the 1HGV Law account, there is a direct link that you can click on and you can read the story for yourself and review it. And I would be grateful if you would um, be a contributing member of society. What is your impact, as I so commonly uh, ask? But if you would read that article, you would see that all crimes, crimes of violence, crimes of theft, crimes of sexual assault, they all go up as the homeless population rises. So if the city is aware of that and the state of Illinois is aware of that and the federal government is aware of that, unless they were in the business of manufacturing crime, they would resolve that. So my, my only hope, you guys, moving forward is that we have AI, right? AI can easily be a case manager. Let's say we're in a facility like the one we're in now. I believe there are 100, 100 rooms here and they accept couples. So they have the capacity to house up to 200 people, right? Very simply, those people can be logged in a Rolodex, in a CRM of sorts, all of their compliance to uh, court-ordered or case management-ordered services, task, um, you know, court dates, um, job, job look, um, searching, uh, volunteering, or none of that, just waking up, hygiene, you know, depending on each individual person, that can all be logged in some sort of CRM that can be created specific to need. Just like EMR has been created to healthcare need. We have electronic medical records in every hospital and doctor's office. That's not universal. Those are not just one standard template. They go in, we get technologists to go in and meet with our doctors and say, okay, what is it that you need? Can I sit in on a visit? What do you ask these patients? What's your H-E-E-N-T? You know, head, ears, eyes, nose, throat. What's your R-O-S, review of sy systems? What is your protocol? Where do you free chart? Where do you need, you know, lines for prescription? Where do you need a data entry field for, you know, environmental impact and circumstances? So we can do the same thing, and I believe we should have. In 2024, there is zero excuse that we should have millions of apps that are money-making apps, that are consumerism-based, and absolutely no you know, central organization for homelessness and services for the, pop, for the poor. I mean, that's obscene. 
So we should already be ahead of the uh, of the game on this, and we should have these central uh, intake systems where we have no need for human case managers, you know, or maybe one human case manager to manage 200 cases because of the AI function. Say, for instance, I do or don't, you know, say, for instance, Susan was ordered to take drug therapy, was ordered to take individual therapy, and was ordered to take therapy with her children or with her parent. If Susan no-shows to that therapy, the integrated electronic record from that therapy should be directly conducted. Uh, connected to the housing resource. So if she no-shows, it sends a, a notice to the housing resource and says, oops, Susan didn't show up today, is she okay? And then maybe the AI sends an email or a text to Susan, hey Susan, you missed your, your you know therapy for the day, are you okay? And Susan has the, the ability to respond, yes, I'm okay, I'll be there tomorrow, or no, I'm not okay. At that point, a human can come up and check on Susan, or if Susan doesn't answer at all, a human can come up and check on Susan. It doesn't eliminate the need for humans, but it dramatically reduces the need, which makes it easier for everyone because they could still get paid the same amount, but there could be one case manager for every space like this. Do you see what I'm saying? And the workload decreases dramatically. And if we have too many people who are able and willing to work in the field of case management, hey, guess what? Take two days a week and still get a full-time salary. Go home with your family and enjoy them. And the same for the people who are living through homelessness. We should not be suffering in 2024. I have said this before and I will say it again. We should not be suffering in 2024. Suffering is not pertinent to the human condition, is not beneficial to the human experience. And people who say that it is are lying.